All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Cactus Razi, who is just actually just up the road in West Hollywood in, in the Los Angeles area. How are you doing today, Cactus? Very well. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and Cactus is the author of the book, Price Maximizing Customer Loyalty Through Personalized Pricing. So let's get straight into it, Cactus, right? Um, just bottom line it for the audience in terms of what do you mean by personalized pricing? What we mean, what we outline in the book is that, you know, you need to think about your customer base uh, and it's, it's, it's broader diversity. And, and a lot of what I'm saying uh, applies very clearly in the B2C environment. And there mm -hmm. are some lessons for the B2B marketplace, particularly if you have sort of a recurring revenue types of businesses or recurring customers. And the idea is to be thoughtful around uh, some of the forces, uh, I would say uh, on the negative side, there's a lot of forces that are causing increasing levels of price transparency, increasing levels of discounting. And on the positive side, there are tools, uh, first and foremost, being much more sophisticated data and analytics tools. And to really start thinking about your customers as individuals, rather than as a homogenous group of people and start thinking about how, how pricing can affect the customer relationship positively. It's not gonna work for every single customer, but you are gonna be able to do a couple of things. Push back against or resist the sort of deflationary uh, heavy discounting of internet-based commerce. And at the same time, create a delightful and differentiated experience for the portion of your customer base that you define on your, your own as the important portion. And so, or, or the customers whose loyalty you're trying to achieve. And I say this because, uh, you know, I have deep experience in applying data analytics in my specific domain, which is capital markets, the bond market specifically. Right. And so in, in many ways, this book's a departure from what I do all day long. But my, in my day job, I thought a lot about um, what's happening in the internet and how it's affecting price transparency. Mm -hmm. And I thought a lot about the application of data analytics, which we do in the bond market. We, we price thousands of thousands of bonds uh, right. by machine. And I said to myself, you know, it's funny, the consumer experience or the customer experience around price, I think is deplorable. I believe right. that there's um, customers have this almost um, inherent incentive to seek discounts. I believe that mm -hmm. customers are pounded with these discounted stories. And now uh, I also believe, by the way, that the way internet has um, created commerce is to go right to price transparency and price competition. The perfect example is obviously airlines, and there are many examples sure. in the book. But it's true that even um, products such as Groupon start to discount a variety of goods and services, in some cases, very personal. And mm -hmm. you say to yourself, where is this going? And how can I sort of avoid the, this destination where there's going to be browser extensions, extensions on your mobile apps that are constantly seeking the best price. And, and we don't really want to end up in that place as a provider of a good or a service. So what can I do first? And second of all, what am I actually trying to achieve when I make a sale? And if the answer mm -hmm. to that question is near-term revenue maximization, then I would argue there's plenty of stuff out there on how to maximize revenue in, in the near term. But if the answer to that question is starting to change due to uh, both our improved technical capabilities, our renewed focus on recurring mm -hmm. revenue streams, then maybe we need to rethink how we're approaching pricing, particularly for the customers that we want to keep. Yeah, no, it's an it's an interesting it's an interesting concept, and and there's a number of things there that I just wanted to come back on. Um, you know, obviously, we have we have trained people to be discount junkies, right? Uh, and I mean, especially in 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 B two C, obviously, and and as you say, um, you know, pricing is out there. Even in B two B, I mean, we kind of have conditioned people to be discount junkies as well. We know largely that we're never going to pay list price unless you know we're we're buying one <laughs> but if we have any number yeah. of people we're going to get some so yeah. in 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 many ways we have you know so you go through a sales cycle when it comes down to actually the pricing it gets it, it becomes its own kind of part of the process because there's all of this negotiation yes it's true and john maybe you'll agree with me but in my life experience i've been surprised by what I would say a, a, a fairly high level of lack of discipline 
around the mm -hmm. pricing question inside of organizations. So the same organ in my life experience and in the experience of, the, of my network, the same organizations that might pour over, you know, in, infinitesimally small details around product. And in fact, even yeah. around campaign and brand and marketing, but when the rubber meets the road, pricing so often is either determined formulaically, some sort of a cost plus mechanism, or potentially by a round table of, of old wise men and women who sit around and say, look, this is, you know, I think we should do X. And this can be yeah. true actually, even for, um, for a variety of products. I, I know this for a fact, many examples in the book, even for large scale one-off experiences, such as very large rock concerts with 100,000 people, right. what should we charge? What's the right ticket charge? And I'm not necessarily suggesting that the current approach is wrong per se, but what I am suggesting is that there are more sophisticated ways to think about price, that um, revenue maximization in every case might not be the right answer. And that if you agree with that, the book was really written at a level of strategy. Let's really think about how we're approaching the question of price. What impact does it have on our customer experience and on our customer loyalty? Should we be thinking about this differently? And particularly, should we be thinking about our customers in, in, uh, and, in, with an implied or assumed homogeneity? Or should we really start to go down the road of thinking about our customers as a collection of individuals with individual behaviors that we can capture through data analytics, yeah. that we can model, and then that, that we can price appropriately? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting it's an interesting concept. And just going back to what you were just saying about how pricing is arrived at, I mean, I often have seen, you know, in my career that often pricing is just done in a comparison way. It's just like, okay, let's look at uh, let's look at five competitors in our market. Yeah. Let's see what their prices are, and let's see if we can come somewhere. And there's no and there's nothing to say that those prices are the correct ones, but we're going to adapt, adapt to those pricing. And so in some ways, I think often everybody's adapting to the prices of everybody else and nobody's putting in the kind of uh, analytics or research around the pricing. We have an example, exact, you hit the nail on the head, the example in the book in hospitality. You know, hotels obviously are, are a differentiated experience relative mm -hmm. to airlines, for example. So you have much more differentiation amongst hotels. And yet many of the hotel systems, the methodology is that the, the, the property, the hotelier chooses five geographically similar and, and, uh, and sort of experientially similar hotels. The number is five and then gets feedback. And it's a give versus take. You, you publish your prices and you get to receive your quote unquote competitors prices. And my question to you is fundamentally, John, you're about to go to a hotel for the sixth time in three years. This is now going to be your sixth visit. Mm -hmm. Should you get the same price as Cactus, who's visiting the first time? And mm -hmm. I'm not saying there's a right answer to that question, but what I am saying is be thoughtful around it. Should a hotel price to its competitors or should it say, look, Cactus Rossi, who's never stayed here before, may or may not be my customer, right? right. John is my customer. And why don't I give him a differentiated experience? And I don't mean a bottle of water. <laughs> I mean, that's nice, but a bottle of water is mm -hmm. essentially a proxy for price, right? So they're giving you a $5 yeah. discount. Well, why yeah. not make him feel special in the moment? And, and, yeah. and, you say, and you'd say to yourself, well, that's kind of complicated to do. And it's actually, it used to be very complicated to do, but it's not anymore because the data analytics are there. And what we're sort of suggesting is commerce over the last hundred years has gone from very individualized because all commerce for yeah. the most part was done on a you know, personal basis. You knew the person mm -hmm. you, you were working with. It could have been a blacksmith. It could have been the guy that was, you know, simple shops and whatever it was a hundred years ago. And, and now with analytics, you know, we lost that obviously as we grew in scale, but with analytics, we're able to recreate that, recreate personalization at scale. And I, I get some pushback from people that say, yeah, but personalization is kind of weak. I get these lame emails that tell me, you know, because I bought a pair of socks, maybe I would be interested in a, in a bow tie or something. And mm -hmm. none of it really seems yeah. to make sense. And I'm, and while I agree with that personalization is kind of lame, we can all at least all agree that most companies believe that greater levels of personalization are the future. And it's, it's still yeah. early days. And my argument is let's please not leave price behind in this conversation. I don't, if you send me an email that says you bought socks from us before, so, so maybe you want to buy socks from us in the future, that's less powerful than giving, than get cutting right to the fulcrum of the transaction, which is at what price?
Yeah, no, it's um, I, I agree with you. And I think um, and in your book, I mean, you talk about this concept of loyalty pricing. And I do I do like that concept because I think I mean, we live in a in an increasingly commoditized world anyway. Uh, and as you say, I mean, there's if you go back to your hotel example, right, if you look at, say, the business travel hotels, you know, your the, you, the, the suite type hotels, you know, yeah. that business, there's very little difference between the different brands right yes. you know and 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 often they're in the same place right so yes. there's nothing really to differentiate. Like, they're like literally yeah. immediately adjacent yeah. yeah yeah absolutely and uh um and therefore i think yeah if i'm coming to somewhere for the sixth time and yes i enjoy the experience or whatever may be there but to be rewarded by to be rewarded where it counts which is yeah. in my pocket yeah. Um, I think I think that's got a lot of merit to it. And I do think so. I, I think that as we enter a hype, uh, I think we're entering the period of hyper personalization. Yes. I've heard that uh, term thrown around. I, I do think there I do think um, pricing should be part of it, because to your point, pricing is often just the afterthought. Right. OK, yes. let's now we've done all this work. Now let's yeah. stick a price on it. Yeah, now I, I don't want to offend any of the road warriors as part of your audience that mm. like collecting their Starwood points or perhaps they like mm. collecting their Delta points. Frankly, I like my Delta points as well. But I am going to propose that a lot of these constructs, these loyalty programs, the punch cards at your local cafe where your 10th coffee is free and whatnot, really are pre technology or pre data analytics approaches. Uh -huh. And they are a proxy for price because it's, it was just, you know, 25 years ago when this stuff all started to become in vogue, there weren't tools available. Today, we have modern CRMs. We have a variety of different tools to be able to really understand who your customer is, define who your customer is. If you think it's smarter to give your customer a, you know, a number of quote unquote loyalty points, knock yourself out. My argument is the customer will be delighted by feeling like their, their loyalty has been rewarded with a differentiated price experience. And, and I'd only like to point out one other thing. If you have a scarce good or service, then, it, then um, a differentiation does not always have to imply lower price. It may be access to that differentiated good or service. Restaurants, a great example. Um, if you frequent a restaurant, let's say two to three times a month, and it's been a couple of years that you visited two to three times a month, it happens to be a Friday night. And also some knucklehead cactus Rossi shows up. You and I are both <laughs> vying for a table. Is it, is it not only should we be receive the same price? That's an open question. We ask it in the yeah. book. Should I even have access to the table if you want it? I would argue, mm -hmm. you, I would argue the business, because uh, many people will, will push back on me and say, yes, but now you've annoyed somebody. And I say, yes, I've annoyed an unknown individual to benefit equally or perhaps to even a greater degree, a known customer whose loyalty mm. I want to maximize. The more of these great customers I have, the more my business is de facto a recurring revenue stream business. I can turn episodic transactions ver closer and closer to almost subscription style business as I, as, I ma as I increase loyalty. And I think that's really at the heart of thinking about loyalty. And it answers the question, why? Why is loyalty important? Because your enterprise value grows as your revenue streams be, you know, move towards recurring. No, I, I agree. And it's interesting, just the whole concept, what you were talking about of the loyalty rewards programs and that. I actually, I, I, I had a pleasure of, of meeting and talking with uh, Bob Crandall, Robert Crandall, who was yeah. the CEO of American Airlines at, yep. at one stage, who actually, who actually pretty much invented this whole concept. Yep. And uh, and that's quite a ways quite a ways back now. Yeah. Um, but but I do think as time has gone on, yeah, I like to get my rewards. You like to get your rewards. But let's face it, rewards are kind of frustrating too because you get them, but they come with restrictions, and you can and when you want to use them, you can never you can really never ever use them the way you want to. It's always complicated and all of that. And so you end often end up in this experience where yes, it's a loyalty reward. But it's not very it's not that satisfying an experience when you go to actually use your your loyalty rewards whereas to your point um if i went to whatever airline um you know american airlines and when i went to get my quote from my airfare it said yeah. you know as as a blah 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 customer yes. and blah 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 here is your price i that for me would be a far greater experience 
I think so as well. I, I think we're all looking for greater levels of simplicity in our lives. I, I you know, mm-hmm. as I said, I, I, you know, and we use a lot of examples in the book, but I don't really want to go through the brain damage of making sure that my credit card gives me various points for my <laughs> airline and, and X and Y and Z. You know, frankly speaking, I, I think with all of the, the very sophisticated data analytic tools that are available to us in today's day and age, I just want the airline to know or I want the restaurant to know. I want, you know, I want people to know that I'm a good customer. I'm demonstrating it. You should know this and you should reward me with this. And if you want to do it with a free dessert at the end of dinner, that's great. And I'll take mm-hmm. it. But, but the point of the book is really to say, let's please be thoughtful around price. And let's be yeah. thoughtful around how these prices are determined. Should they be the same for all customers? Should they be the same at all times? These are conversations that are being had. The restaurant industry is a great example. It's gone through a terrible time with the pandemic, obviously. Mm-hmm. And coming out of it, I think you and I could probably agree, and most of your listeners would agree, that a meal on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Sh- should probably not cost the same as on Friday at 8 p.m. Yeah. There's, it's a two totally different experiences, two totally different demand curves. We can get nerdy about it, you know, with, mm-hmm. and, and so you say to yourself, uh, well, if that's true, what else might be true around price? And I, and I also feel with so much commerce being done electronically these days, again, this is an effect that's been tremendously accelerated by the pandemic. We are able to identify who the customer is. We do have logins. We do have cookies. We do have apps. Mm-hmm. We do have push notifications. And so, you know, these tools are available to us. The fundamental question is, how, how are we going to use them? And should price be part of that conversation? My argument is yes. Yeah, and, and I would and I would totally agree with you, Cactus, because I, I, as we said earlier, I mean, I do think that, um, you know, price is often an afterthought and it's un unscientific enough and how it's arrived at but to your point i don't think it's i don't think a lot of people look at it as a strategic relationship point right they look at it as and and let's face it you even see this in in a lot of you know sales interaction like people are like we're going to come to the whole price discussion now um whereas you should actually be welcoming that uh, if you had if you were taking a more strategic approach to it uh, then you should actually welcome it because it should actually translate into more value for the cu- for the customer i think that's exactly right and i feel that one of the reasons i mean I, i've had a 35 year career in sales now it's uh, primarily been institutional of course and i operate in capital markets as of the last roughly 23 mm-hmm. years but but conceptually the price conversation is a wonderful opportunity to understand where you stand with your customer and and what they think of you and it can be really illuminating because uh, arguably and you know if your customer couldn't care less about your end of the bargain you need to be thoughtful about how much resources you're going to be devoting to that customer if you yeah. if none of your customers care about your business you need to be thoughtful about what your business is and what its future looks like I, I understand that there's always price competition, and I don't mean to sound naive, but I would only say that rather than dreading the price conversation, I view it as a wonderful opportunity to really understand who you're doing business with, and, and it's an opportunity to differentiate amongst the range of customers and devote resources appropriately. It's a, it's a really nice illuminating tool. Yeah, no, and I, I agree with you. And I think this is going to become more critical as uh, it becomes because because of the relationship piece and the holding on to customers piece, the retention piece. Um, and as you mentioned earlier about the pandemic, right? I mean, I think coming out of the, the pandemic, um, you know, there's probably a lot of businesses who lost customers. Uh, but maybe there isn't as many uh, new new business opportunities available right now. It seems so. Existing customers become way, way, way more important. Way and, more important. Um, not that they shouldn't have been in the first place, but so anything you can do strategically to ensure you hold on and keep those uh, customers happy is a good thing. That's 100% correct. You know, it's funny you mentioned American Airlines. One of my professors at NYU was actually on the team that developed a lot of their dynamic pricing models uh, back in the 80s. And it's, uh, you know, one of the other examples people use is churn. And data analytics is at the heart of mm-hmm. churn control for, for the types of businesses that have churn problems, such as, you know, mobile, mobile phone operators and whatnot. Sure. My argument is you've devoted a whole heck of a lot of resources to predicting the customers who are most likely to jump ship. And let me ask you the question, what resources have you devoted to the customers who, who appear to be happy and don't have the time or energy to shop around from Sprint to T-Mobile, which is now one company, to AT&T, to Verizon? And you know, these are interesting, thought-provoking questions. 
I, I think that's a I, I'm, I'm fantastic that you brought that up because I think that's an extremely uh, good thing for people to contemplate on because to your point is yes when people are when customers are happy we tend to ignore them they're happy yeah. don't don't uh, yeah. you know don't do anything to rock the boat over there yeah. and we focus on oh who, where's our red flags today the same thing is i would say it's kind of like that i would say the comparison it's kind of like when people do performance reviews right they say well cactus come in you've done yes you you know this year you've been very good at x now here's the 5000 things that you're not doing well yes. that i want you to work on next year yeah. so we always have it backwards yeah. We always have it backwards. To your point, like instead of focusing on the good things that you do and trying to make sure that you get to do more of them, same thing. Instead of focusing on our on our um, loyal and existing customers and trying to make them even more so, we focus on on. So we're reactive. I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's a more about that's crisis right. management. And you know, John, that's at, at the core of the book is this idea that we what we do initially is we lay out, hey, these are the forces that are around you. This is what is happening. Like it or not to sole proprietorships, mid-sized companies, and, and, and global corporations, meaning the changes in how business is done, how commerce is done, uh, the transparency around price, and, and, and the way in which information is presented to the consumer. In fact, at the tail end of the book, we also say, look, if you don't like what's happening now, and if you believe that automation is going to be a theme that will continue mm -hmm. into the future yep. many of your listeners and many of my network have these home assistants such as alexa and whatnot and as that becomes a, a medium to do commerce you can immediately see it's bad enough that when you go to book a hotel room booking.com or kayak or other things and this is true if you you know if you want you know, this is true for many goods and services. Things are ranked typically by price. Can you imagine the future where you no longer have to deal with a visual user interface? You simply tell Alexa that you want a pair of Levi's 541s, 32 waist, 36 length, and it scours the internet for that item along with any available coupons and automatically delivers you the lowest possible price. And in fact, probably will assure you of that fact. And so you say to yourself, boy, now I, I didn't even have a fighting chance. I wasn't even in the yeah. queue of possible outcomes. And so, you know, I, I, while I'm not necessarily predicting a dystopian future, I'm not in the prediction business. I'm in the business of seeing what's actually happening around us, getting a sense of where, what the future holds and asking businesses to be really thoughtful around uh, are, whether they're taking action to counteract some of the forces by using some of the tools that are newly available. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point. Uh... And I do think that's one that people need to to consider as dystopian as it may sound. I mean, this is the reality of this is where we are headed and you can either you can either put your head in the sand or you can figure out a way of meeting it um, head on. And normally the best way is to kind of move the goalposts a little bit is figure out how you can do something different yeah. so that you don't have to necessarily go down the same trajectory as everybody else. That's exactly right. Uh, yeah, 100 yeah. percent. Well, listen, this has been fantastic, Cactus. Again, the book is called Price maximizing customer loyalty through personalized pricing and the book will be a link to the book will be available under this video as well as all the information about cactus but before we go please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do well you know it's funny i grew up in i grew up in i'm an iranian immigrant i came in 1974 five years before the revolution grew up in santa monica mm -hmm. always wanted to be in finance uh, sold every you know i was in music advertising i, I uh, uh, you know i had sold advertising i had sold skis sold a lot of things since i was 15 years old wanted to be on wall street i sold all my possessions moved out to wall street got rejected by more than 30 firms but ultimately found a job at goldman sachs and built a, a frankly a, a notable career i'll call it in security sales specifically bond sales um, and since then have then started my own company which was sold last year and i still am at the forefront of automation in bond markets and uh, still find these these topics to be fascinating and interesting and i and, and i love the idea of you know data analytics and applications of data analytics in other domains as well yeah, no, I, and, and I think that's a, I think it's a great place to be, uh, because we've heard so much about big data, uh, but at the end of the day, it really is small data that matters. It's about getting in and analyzing that data and finding the data that's relevant to you, to your industry, to your segment, to wherever you are in. Um, and so, and one statistic I read recently is that uh, you know people have assumed all along that big data is something that big businesses do yes. but there's a greater trend in small and medium-sized businesses really getting into data analytics now for a lot of the reasons you outlined yes 
that's exactly right. I mean, I think we have tools to help us understand who our customers are, what are their behaviors, and uh, uh, sort of essentially get to know your customer at scale in a way that's just simply not possible through individual human relationships. Um, obviously, CRM platforms are a great way to do that thing. Uh, and I feel that, you know, that's why I wanted to open the door to having this conversation. And the lens I was using is price. Yeah, no, fantastic. Well, listen, thanks, Cactus. Uh, thanks, thanks to all of you for listening and watching. And I will see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.